For those who are not in the last week's lecture, so let me introduce uh, Professor Peter Forrester again. I'm delighted to, uh, to introduce Professor uh, Peter Forrester as a distinguished speaker of the Kias Springer series in mathematics. His research primarily focuses on mathematical physics, particularly in the field of uh, random matrix theory and related areas of statistical mechanics. His seminal work, Logo Gases and Random Matrices, which is a comprehensive about 800 page long monograph published by Princeton University Press in 2010, is widely recognized as a manuscript, uh, masterpiece in the field of random matrix theory. Throughout his illustrious career, Professor Forrester has received numerous accolades for his contributions, including the medals of the, of the Australian Mathematical Society in 1993, election to the uh, Australian Academy of Sciences in 2004, and several Australian Research Council personal fellowships. From 2012 to uh, uh, 2014, Professor Forrester served as the president of the Australian Mathematical Society, which highlights his uh, esteemed position as a leader in the Australian mathematical community. Surveying the rapid progress of the field of random matrix theory after 2010, Professor Forrester recently co-authored a book on non-homation random matrix theory with Dr. Song Su Byung, a member of the Center for Mathematical Challenges at KIAS. In two distinguished lectures, one last week and the other one uh, today, Professor Forrester presented and will present some aspects of this monograph. Let's extend our warmest welcome to Professor Peter Forrester. Well, uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Kang, and um, it's uh, quite an honor to be able to give these uh, indeed titled lectures, distinguished lectures. I quite feel quite chuffed when I tell my colleagues in the corridors that I'm giving us some distinguished lectures uh, in um, the Kies uh, career, so uh, quite remarkable. Uh, how that come about, as I said, um, getting involved in this uh, project of um, writing about this Donohomitian family of random matrices called Geneva Ensembles with uh, Sung Su, that's um, the beginnings, and then uh, having uh, support, Professor Kang to, um, in some sense, sponsor our uh, submission uh, by um, encouraging us to uh, um, drawing our attention to this particular series. And at the moment, uh, we're in the refereeing process with our 200 page approximately uh, monograph on this topic. Um, last week, I uh, began um, in an historical way. I uh, highlighted uh, specifically aspects of Geneva's paper and um, took also a viewpoint that to properly appreciate Geneva's contribution, we needed to uh, revise the uh, earlier works of um, you know, Dyson and um, to some extent of Wigner. So I really did that. Um, I also highlighted um, the analogy that uh, Geneva made between his uh, eigenvalue probability density function and a um, statistical mechanical model called the two-dimensional one-component plasma. So you might see uh, here in uh, my outline from last week, the two, two main parts, and I was in the progress of um, discussing again because I wanted to go through the historical development thermodynamic properties associated with this analogy of the Geneva's eigenvalue uh, point process. And I'll continue that because I'm a fairly slow speaker. I uh, do uh, spend a bit of time on each slide and uh, have a few slides that I didn't quite get through. That will be continued. Um, when that's finished, we will move to what is um, new for this uh, second uh, and final of the lectures in this um, Distinguished series, thank you. Um, and I'll emphasize aspects of the uh, two-point correlation function, which uh, it's sort of the next level up if you think from um, thermodynamic properties, but on the other hand, it uh, interrelates with thermodynamic properties. So I've got it in my mind again here, the statistical mechanics perspective, mainly of the two-dimensional one-component plasma, but the correlation functions are of course a 
a key descriptors of point processes, you know, which is another large theme that overlaps with the um, Geneva ensembles and myself and Sung Tzu uh, have a section in our, um, in our book uh, relating to point processes too. It's just a, a very active topic with uh, very fruitful um, advances being made right up to this day. So that will um, be, you know, the theme will take up uh, correlation functions, but specifically sort of the um, particular feature that was noted in the next level of research beyond Geneva's contribution. You know, when my colleague uh, at the time, uh, Jenka Vesey, you know, realized that um, one can use these exact solutions, two dimensional, well, of Geneva's type to probe actually boundary effects. And boundary effects were um, you know, not really thought of in uh, Dyson Wigner times. Uh, they were really considering bulk properties. So this is a, a point that I want to emphasize and I'll finish off with um, a topic that uh, again, can be traced back to that same time when uh, Jankovici and colleagues decided to make use of this model in from the perspective of Coulomb systems, where uh, boundary conditions, you know, very, very uh, natural beyond just the hard wall boundary. Um, one can have you know, a metallic boundary, which uh, mathematically is Dirichlet boundary conditions. One could have Neumann boundary conditions, which actually relate to one of the other Geneva ensembles, uh, the Gin SE. So that's how I'll close, and we'll talk about. The same, you know, simultaneous to this, some effects um, in the expansion, asymptotic expansion of the partition function that um, tell us something about um, the topology of domains, which is a, a very, very present topic. Uh, here we are um, from last week. Where did we get to? Well, we were dealing with the a one dimensional version of this um, two dimensional one component plasma. So what is that one dimensional version? It's logarithmic uh, interacting repelling particles now in a circle in random matrix theory coming from Dyson's circular ensembles. Now within uh, Dyson's paper there, there is a uh, conjecture for the partition function as a function of beta for finite n. And that was uh, subsequently proved. And from that knowledge, um, well, we want to actually calculate thermodynamic properties. And that's what I was talking about. And one of the primary thermodynamic properties is the average energy and um, energy per particle. So it's expected to be what's called extensive. So the total energy is after having a so-called charge neutral system, which we'll come back to, should be extensive and therefore portion of N. So the large N limit if divide by N um, should give some well-defined uh, function of both two variables. Let's think about it physically. There is a variable corresponding to the um, spacing between the particles. You know, this is the reciprocal of the density. And there is a, a temperature variable. There are um, our thermodynamic variables. In random matrix theory, the beta values one, two, and four have special significance as we revised last week uh, in the one dimensional case. Um, they are to do with the symmetries that Dyson and Wigner uh, imposed for the application of the random matrix ensembles to uh, uh, complex quantum mechanical systems. But the present we're thinking differently with, and as Dyson did, this is an extract, both these points here are extracts from Dyson's, uh, one of Dyson's papers in the series that he wrote. And I wanted to uh, um, do a couple of things here. One is, well, what is this functional form? What can we learn from it beyond um, observing that it uh, has a simple dependence on the density and also is an analytic function for real part of beta greater than zero? Well, these days, you know, the simplest thing to do is just to plot the function. And what do we observe about that? Well, we observe that it has negative slope. And uh, in this particular, uh, what I've plotted here, I've left this term out. We actually see that the remaining term actually does go to zero. Um, so we've got some uh, large uh, values of beta, that's low temperature, going to some uh, zero energy point, as it turns out in this normalization. We have, as I say, a negative slope. Well, the negative slope makes sense 
because the interpretation of the derivative of the uh, energy per particle with respect to beta is actually the so-called specific heat. Specific heat is a variance. So it actually has to be positive. So that's um, reassuring that, and you know, of course we can compute this derivative. And it's in uh, Dyson's um, particular, oh, so what does Dyson uh, indicate to us? It's sort of always good to read the masters as the saying goes. Um, you know, he is emphasizing the random matrix couplings and also other extremes, which um, I want to say a little bit about at least. Beta tends to zero, that's high temperature weak coupling. And beta tends to infinity, that is a type of, that's the ground state. And I was saying last week that one can actually do expansions about um, these particular points. In fact, one can expand about all these points. Um, and uh, get further exact information, which one would want to assimilate in a, in a broader theory. So I'll go a little bit down that path and then take that same sort of line in the two dimensional case. So um, what are we gonna do here? We're going to immediately go to the two dimensional case. I think I'll um, just leave it with the, the facts that uh, that's the way of thinking that's coming from uh, the Dyson's classic paper. And if we'd um, studied that paper, you know, we'd be uh, persuaded to make um, some, some uh, investigate analogous quantities in the two dimensional case. So here we are, this is um, for beta equals two up to this uh, particular factor, which I'll comment on in a moment. This is the GNUE probability density function so this is Gaussian matrices, standard uh, entries, uh, mean zero, uh, complex variance one, um, gives rise to a probability density function proportional to this factor here. There's a natural beta generalization, as I say, highlighted uh, first in the series of papers by Wigner and Dyson, or particularly Dyson, and then noted too in uh, Geneva's paper. Now, the way of thinking that I introduced last week, that's a little bit different, setting up for the Boltzmann factor is that we would like to begin with what's called a charge neutral system. In our disk of radius R, we put in the one, in the, uh, one component plasma model, a neutralizing smeared out um, uniform density background. So uh, if that's a negative, uh, if the particles themselves are thought to have unit positive charges, that background would have total um, charge density minus n, so it's charge neutral. And the significance of doing the calculation that um, takes us to the, that couples us with the background is that we can understand how to go from this logarithmic uh, potential here to obtain this uh, quadratic attraction to the origin, for example. And furthermore, we get some normalization terms. These normalization terms are to do with the interaction between the particles and background and background and background. But they are of some, some, some significance. Um, for a charge neutral Coulomb system, we expect the, the free energy to be um, extensive. Therefore, we expect this, the logarithm of, of this quantity, oh, um, not quite this quantity, we've got to form the partition function, one on n factorial the integral over this quantity. We expect the logarithm of that to um, be asymptotically e to the n times something. That's a non-trivial mathematical statement and uh, we'll come back to that near the end. But the time being, we'll also um, follow the one dimensional uh, lead that, that Dyson uh, gave us and make a comment that this thermodynamic pressure um, associated with our two dimensional one component plasma as defined is essentially trivial as far as a mathematical calculation goes, because the pressure is, the thermodynamic pressure is the derivative of the log of our partition function with respect to the volume. And the volume actually after change of variables completely factors out. So this is this R, which you don't see in the random matrix case, you only see Ns. You know, this is the slight generalization or the least generalization in way of thinking, that there is a radius, there is a density, you know, the density, uh, here is n, the usual, n pi r squared uh, for a disk. R factors out, um, but it comes with an interesting factor that uh, shows itself quite a bit. 
And so we saw this factor in the um, Dyson log gas, that's the analog on the circle, one minus beta on two. The uh, factor in two dimension becomes one minus beta on four. Now beta on two, beta equals two is still the special coupling, the so-called you know, free Fermi uh, point. But um, the zero point for this thermodynamic pressure is now beta equals four. Beta equals four is something very important in the theory of uh, Coulomb systems. If we consider the analog of this same Coulomb system and have um, positive and negative charges, it's a sort of famous result that beta equals four is this costless thallus uh, phase transition. But that's uh, slight, slightly off the topic for today. Let's make that as a by the way, by the way remark. But beta equals four is uh, very important in the two in the theory of the two dimensional Coulomb systems generally the one component and two component systems. What can we do? Uh, well, what we can't do, let's say first, we can't um, calculate this free energy as a function of beta. We have only the beta equals two to start with at least. Remembering you know, Dyson uh, highlighted the um, random metric couplings, beta equals zero and beta equals infinity. Now, random matrix couplings, uh, here we only have the one, the beta equals two. Even though there is a gin SE and a gin OE, they, as we um, may comment last week, they do not correspond to beta equals one and two. What they correspond to is some image charges and some different boundary conditions on the real uh, axes. So it's uh, that's a distinction. And furthermore, whereas Dyson had this um, constant term X conjecture, and could extrapolate all beta, it is not expected that this um, partition function here can be uh, written in a product form. In fact, you can say something stronger here, you can actually do numerical calculations using um, Jack polynomial theory and uh, for finite n, say for beta equals four, and then you can check, you know, is there a signature of products of um, and ratios of gamma functions? The answer is no, because you get these huge prime numbers, uh, which is saying you're well outside the class of um, nice products of beta type integrals. So there's evidence that uh, beta equals two here is, um, is rather unique. And here is this product of gamma function um, expression that comes from the normalization that um, is part of Geneva's calculation when he obtained the eigenvalue probability density function. Being a probability density function, what Geneva was considering was properly normalized for us. Remember the partition function, slightly different or the configuration integral. This is um, something that we uh, feed into a term, well, to this integral, which is furthermore normalized for us. We do all that, um, we have the, you know, just take minus the logarithm. That gives us our dimensionless free energy divided by N per particle. And we get some specific um, value here. Uh, what can we say about this apart from that it's uh, very simple? Well, we can say that we can understand the dependence on this density. With artificial, we're not, we've set the problem up with the density. Remember density to do with our, the radius of our disk. And uh, it has to be from the previous um, scaling, it has to have this very simple um, dependence. So indeed, uh, we just, just double check that uh, it's consistent in that sort of sense. And furthermore, we have some numerical factor. Um, you, know, you might ask, well, what can you do with that? Uh, certainly the most obvious thing to do with that is actually not to work with that, but more accessible is the um, internal energy per particle. But internal energy per particle, the usual formalism to calculate that and what we did in the Dyson log gas or what Dyson did is take a derivative with respect to beta. Now, if we only have an exact solution of beta equals two, how do we take that derivative? Well, here is where we make use, and this is what I commented uh, last week, we make use of the correlation functions. Now, the price we pay for making use of the correlation functions um, as formulated here in the infinite system is that even though this is um, used as something standard in the theory of fluids, you know, mathematically, it does require an interchanging of limits to actually uh, establish an identity like this. And that interchange of limits has, to, to my knowledge, uh, hasn't been rigorously 
rigorously justified after the event, we can sometimes do these calculations uh, in two ways and we'll see it is possible to, to directly calculate this internal, well, to do a calculation that gives this internal energy without going by this formula and we get we, we do reclaim this um, expression. But this is important to us because we're heading towards um, saying more about correlation functions. And it's, in, it's a link between thermodynamic quantities and correlation function. So remember here is Geneva's um, result for the two point function. So Geneva showed us that the GNUE is a determinable point process. The two point correlation, this is the connected part, is a two by two determinant. This is the product of the off diagonals in the two by two determinant. And somewhat surprisingly, it actually decays as a Gaussian. As I say, that's surprising in Coulomb systems where what was familiar to people was the bayh theory where there is a correlation length which predicts a, um, an exponential decay. So there's something special about beta equals two for the fact that it's actually uh, faster than an exponential decay, it's a Gaussian decay. Continuing, I wanted to uh, indicate here, this is a, a development beyond uh, my historical progression. Um, I'm really uh, nowhere, nowhere beyond the uh, 1980s, but I take us to 2010 because um, in the mathematical side of our uh, subject matter is some integrability, some um, something, be, something that one cannot expect to hold in general. And what um, this author, Shakarov, was able to show by starting with finite n, he was able to obtain the actual asymptotic expansion. You know, this is interest generally to a lot of us. Um, Indeed, so I just want to emphasize that again, starting with finite n, using the definition of the energy per particle, you know, which is just the, the average of the, um, the, the contribution to the internal energy, the uh, particle particle and the particle background. He found some integral structure. He found that actually that this quantity is a function of n satisfies a third order recurrence in n. From that third order recurrence in n, he was actually able to find the basis of solutions, find the right linear combination for that basis, and then um, compute the asymptotic expansion. So that's uh, a point of interest for us because it, it makes, um, gives us, reclaims the formula that we saw at leading order, but it also indicates to us a, a surface tension type term and a constant term, and it shows us that the series is actually relates to root n throughout. So it's, um, an interesting result for a couple of reasons, as I say, for its interpretation and also for the for the um, the mathematics. Next, next, I would like to um, emphasise that there is interesting mathematics associated with the ground state energy. So there's been uh, you know, quite a bit of progress from um, Serfati and her uh, collaborators on this topic over a you know, period of the last decade. It's been one of the um, significant advances, I'd say, uh, generally relating to Coulomb systems. So it's not a random matrix coupling, but we're following Dyson here, where Dyson says uh, physically interesting limits. Well, we know the ground state's physically interesting. Um, and we'll see what's the problem. Well, uh, what's the task, I should say. If for classical statistical mechanics, if there is a unique minimum of the um, potential energy, then the um, ground state, you know, it's a unique ground state. So we, you know, we calculate the uh, ground state energy simply from that one configuration. That's really the, the way of thinking. If we go back to the one dimensional case, um, that's the log gas on the circle coming from Dyson circular ensembles of unitary matrices. The um, ground state is just equally spaced particles. And there is some degeneracy because of a rotation invariance, but uh, otherwise it's equally spaced particles. In two dimensions, as a conjecture, it's been a conjecture for a long time for um, the logarithmic potential that we actually get a triangular lattice. That's the conjecture. So that's one conjecture. There are more conjectures. So the conjecture that uh, we can, one can actually compute what the um, ground state energy is using a limiting process
from this uh, so-called risk potential. So the risk potential, back when I was beginning, as, as I've said in, in my background in the field as a master's student in the early 80s, people were studying the um, statistical mechanics of, of risk uh, uh, of particle systems interacting by this risk potential. I've noticed, you know, over 40 years later now that uh, it's back in the literature. Now, it's well known that um, here, it's just a simple elementary limit, that as S goes to zero, and after subtracting this one, we actually limit to the log potential. So it's the sum, um, something quite reasonable that this is, and after neutralizing it, so this is sort of the, the concept of having a background, that if we happen to know how to compute this as a function of S, that by applying this limiting process, we could get information about the ground state energy. That sounds quite reasonable. However, I'm quite aware, I'm aware of a paper that uh, hasn't really been picked up on much, but it actually proves that as a function of S, there's a discontinuity at S equals zero for this. It's an interesting topic. And I, in my honors year, before I started as a master's student, I actually studied lattice sums. And some advances afterwards asked the question about what is the domain of analyticity of a quantity like this? And unfortunately, there is a discontinuity right at S equals naught. But if we ignore that discontinuity, um, I think we'll have to add that to our review, Sung Su, about the discontinuity. I only really came across that paper relatively recently. It's just, um, as I say, not that appreciated. If we ignore that discontinuity and um, take advantage of the remarkable fact that that particular um, for the triangle ladders, for the risk potential, it is actually possible to analytically continue that sum using some number theory. So this is a particular quadratic form. Um, there is uh, some fortunate circumstances for some of these uh, arithmetic type um, summations that they can be written in very simple form, Riemann zeta function and particular L function. And that particular L function in the limit can be further evaluated. And this is a, an established now conjecture. It's established because um, some very accurate numerical res, uh, work was done for configurations on the sphere that, that uh, very much closely agree with this. And it's part of the paper. It's, it's certainly in our review, myself and Sung Su. Another point of interest here is that this gives rise, and this is what uh, Serpity and colleagues were um, emphasizing. This um, relates very much to uh, another physical effect, the physical effect in the theory of superconductors that appears, certain classes of superconductors pierced by a magnetic field, where it's known that that magnetic field induces vortices which uh, have a, an effective logarithmic uh, interaction. And it has been experimentally observed for a long time now that there is a triangular lattice uh, that, uh, they, that is their preferred configuration. So to say, there's a lot of content um, by us considering the two dimensional one component plasma in different limits. And the limit emphasized here is the low temperature limit, ground state limit. I could also have added a slide, which I'm not going to do for time considerations, on the high temperature limit, but in the question time last week, I did mention that because the high temperature limit is this debye huckel limit where people in field theory have actually made some rigorous studies and um, an effect that happens in the high temperature limit that's uh, of interest mathematically is, is renormalization. So if one tries to consider these high temperature limits in a finite system, and we're interested in correction terms in asymptotic series, one gets led to the requirement of having to regularize some particular um, products or sums that appear. In some cases that has been made rigorous. So enough said perhaps, let us change, uh, slightly change ways of thinking from thermodynamic quantities to um, say more about correlation functions, even though correlation functions have already appeared in one method we've used to calculate the average energy. Instead of calculating average energies, back in the classic series of papers that Dyson wrote, um, this was paper number four, which is done in collaboration with Beta, in applications of their um, statistical theory, they point out 
this particular class of statistics that are called linear statistics, where the um, quantity being averaged depends on individual eigenvalues. They wanted to compare the results of the theory, predictions of the theory to experimental data. And um, you know, the simplest uh, quantities to measure beyond um, the actual mean itself is these fluctuations. And they really uh, elaborated on the theory of fluctuations. Theory of fluctuations, two point fluctuations takes us to two point uh, correlations. So my notation here, this is this connected two point function, which for again, for a Geneva Ginui is the uh, off diagonal of the um, two by two determinant that uh, specifies this quantity. That is, um, What's the word here? It's a, how to express this. It's, it's one of the terms. You know, the other term is um, basically just a one point contribution. I'll explain more about the significance of these, these particular two terms here. But this is what appears just from the definitions. If we ask the question, what is the variance of a linear statistic? We get that we have to average over this uh, two point quantity um, in, in this uh, double integral sense here. If we ask about covariances, it's essentially the same, uh, same formula. Indeed, I'd like to say uh, more about this, this uh, particular combination of correlation functions of this connected two point function and this uh, one point function with the delta function. It can be obtained directly if we ask for the covariance of these particular um, densities. Well, these microscopic densities can be thinking Coulomb systems, perhaps as charge, charge densities. And then this is a covariance. So it's a, it can be thought of as a charge charge correlation. Um, indeed, let's uh, say more about some physical interpretation of this. Perhaps, uh, yeah, here we start this delta function, what we're doing is fixing in a Coulomb's perspective, fixing a charge at uh, lambda dash and asking what is the charge density at, at that particular point. So the charge density, since we're a one component system is just the particle density. Now, for our action of fixing a charge with this Coulomb gas perspective, there is a reaction, there is um, a response of the system. And that response of the system is to neutralize that charge. It screens the charge. So that's the viewpoint that one has of these two terms. That's a screening term, a cloud that surrounds, that responds to this particular charge being fixed. And that's a delicate balance between the fixed charge and the response. And a very basic principle in Coulomb systems is the neutrality. So if we have this screening charge uh, cloud viewpoint of our charge charge correlation, then Physically, we expect it to be zero. Now in the canonical ensemble where we have this finite end formulation, that's indeed uh, uh, just an identity from the very definitions. Problem, as, as uh, we already saw in our um, two point function being related to the energy is that we have to interchange limits here. Now you might think that that could always be done. Well, that would be quite wrong. It cannot always be done. Uh, if one considers very simple statistical mechanical systems, such as the free, um, yeah, free particle, uh, what, what's the terminology? The uh, perfect gas, then when we take the large end limit, this, this, quite a, this statement, or this particular statement here, neither of them are true anymore. But for Coulomb systems, it's fundamental, but not proved. Um, there is a very recent paper on the archive that was revised, it was withdrawn for a couple of years. There was a the author had discovered an error. I'm just really showing this for the two dimensional one component plasma. Um, so it's, it's highly non-trivial. Uh, so it's uh, <clears throat> possibly now a theorem. But <clears throat> from the physics perspective, it's fundamental. Uh, excuse my croaky voice. So what's it say at the level of the um, correlation functions? If we integrate the connected two point function we get minus of the density. So as I say, it's a type of screening. That's what it's saying from um, 
the definitions there, but this, this is a large end limit statement. That's the non-triviality of it. That's gonna be uh, important to us. So please keep that in mind. As I say, that is a, a present day research problem. This relates to this concept of hyper uniformity. The fact that the uh, integral here is actually zero. It holds, expected to hold for all of these long range systems that in some sense require a smeared out background. We saw the use of this uh, sum rule um, back in lecture one. We uh, saw it actually again today, uh, if counting on slide four. The way we saw it was that I set the problem up um, back in lecture one for the, the log gas on the circle, you know, with a radius R. So we have a density in there, but we know that our free energy and our um, internal energy have a very simple dependence on rho. So there has to be some mechanism for us to factor out the dependence on the density. And that mechanism, as it turns out, is precisely the fact that if we integrate over the two-point function, because of the factorizing properties of the log, it turns into a sum when we multiply um, scale x, we are making use of this identity here and, and it's consistent with this scaling of the density. So that's uh, one particular uh, uh, place. Uh, it's a sort of self-consistent that it, to, to make sense that it has to be the case, but it's not quite the same thing as a mathematical uh, uh, proof for general circumstances. So I wanted to say that this innocuous looking um, sum rule, we call them, where this total charge in the screening cloud is zero, is uh, one of the underpinnings of a very popular topic in point processes over the last decade or so is hyper uniformity. We're asking a question in this topic about a specific particular uh, linear statistic. This linear statistic is counting, giving us a one every time a particle is in a domain uh, capital lambda. So it's asking uh, how many particles are there in that particular domain? Well, on average, you know, it's just the density uh, times the area there, but the interesting quantity uh, as Dyson had already uh, indicated to us is to ask about the variance. So we know the variance is integral over this particular um, charge-charge uh, correlation. We do a few manipulations here. They're all legitimate manipulations. We can um, separate out a term, which goes like the volume of the region that we're, this is this, my notation here, but volume of the region that we're probing, the number of particles in, and a correction term. Why is it called a correction term? Because one looks carefully at that correction term using translation invariance of a fluid state, which certainly true for the um, beta equals two coupling uh, of the, two dimensional one component plasma and it's expected to be true for a large, uh, a large domain of beta values that we're in a fluid phase. Um, so then that's a function of R minus R dash. We can do some change of variables and we can actually factor out the um, R dependence from the R dash dependence and convince ourselves that the R dash integral is actually proportional to the boundary rather than the volume. And this is a well-established uh, calculation. You'll see this repeated uh, in uh, recent um, studies, uh, reviews, et cetera, on hyper-uniformity. Um, Gosh and Lebowitz, for example. Uh, this is, comes back to this cal uh, original calculation from around about 1980, which are uh, following a historical um, lineage here. Um, but still, it is significant, you know, it's a popular topic and um, one has to be very uh, familiar, you know, with the reasoning here, pointing out aspects of uh, features of the two-point correlation function. Now, previous slide, we emphasized that the integral over our charge-charge correlation is zero in the thermodynamic, in this large end limit. So this term that otherwise, when this is non-zero, would behave like the volume of the uh, region we're probing for large volumes it is, is not there. So the leading term becomes proportional to the surface area. That's actually known to be the um, slowest possible growth, even for a crystal state it's to do, you know, it's, it's a subtlety, but uh, that's, that's the slowest it can possibly grow. 
Um, yeah, all exact calculations can be done in the Geneva case. One can show that asymptotically for, for large uh, disk size, this integral over R dash, you know, behaves precisely like uh, what I've written down here and you get a precise um, value for the variance. Now in the 1D case, already uh, Dyson had highlighted that that's um, an analogous effect. Uh, you don't get the variance going like the size of the interval, interval L, uh, but you don't get it quite going like the um, surface area. The surface area would just be a constant. In the one dimensional case, it's a famous result that this is um, some precise dependence on beta with a logarithmic dependence on, on the size there. So this is our first um, discussion of the consequences of a property, a general property of the two-point function. A property of the two-point function, which is uh, illustrated for the uh, GNUE case, but it's expected to be um, generally true. And as I say, sort of some very recent research is uh, giving, claiming that there is now a proof of this um, vanishing or, or this hyper uniformity property for the two dimensional one component plasma. Next, um, in changing the class of functions that we're probing from the indicator function for a region is discontinuous. It's mathematically um, not nice because it has a, that non different you know, it changes uh, non differentiable obviously on the boundary. It's very natural and again it was done in the Dyson uh, series to, to look at smooth linear statistics. So uh, a formula holds that doesn't hold in the case of the discontinuity. Smooth linear statistics, it's um, simple to, especially in the fluid state where we can have translation invariance, to have this um, Fourier transform go from the double integral to a single integral in Fourier transform variables. Now this is uh, of interest too, because it's a very well-known quantity in the theory of fluids. The Fourier transform, of the charge charge correlation function is this structure function, sometimes called spectral form factor. That's a key quantity and it's supposed to have some universal properties as we'll see in a moment. Um, what's my notation here? No, I, got, look, I pointed to the wrong thing. Here is the, uh, is the Fourier transform. That's the Fourier transform of our uh, test function. Yeah, the C hat, uh, is the for is the charge charge uh, structure function I should say here. Now um, again, following Dyson, um, to make use of some expected universal properties of our um, structure function, one wants to impose a length scale on the um, the linear statistic. So this linear statistic at the moment, the way of thinking is that it's varying on the same length scale as the space between eigenvalues. Now the idea is to make this change on a much slower varying length scale. In fact, a length scale that goes off limits up to infinity. And if one it puts in this new length scale, it, one can observe um, making use of what can be checked in the case beta equals two and what's expected to be true for general beta greater than naught. And that is that there is a well-defined um, large length scale limit of this uh, structure function. That's um, expected to be true, as I say, it can be easily be established to be true from this exact formula here. One can just check from the definition that we will get, um, it's just basically the small mod K expansion with some scaling of the L's to account for the uh, Fourier transform. That, that, does, that is a well-defined limit. And we get a much simpler formula here. One of these um, key, or one of these very well-known type formulas in um, double scaling limit here, large N, and also the um, slowly varying length scale. So that's um, telling us something about this small K behavior, which is significant and can be understood, as I mentioned here in a um, Coulomb heuristic, 
of screening a charge, uh, not just total, total charge, but actually following a very slowly varying external charge, uh, neutralizing it basically. That's important uh, when we come to ask the question about what goes on in on the boundary to be aware of such um, viewpoints, linear uh, response type viewpoints. So we're going to be soon coming to the uh, response or to the uh, variation on the boundary, which I said was one of the sort of advances that studying um, Geneva type uh, solvable systems um, gave us um, when you know, different communities took an interest in, in Geneva's papers, as I say, in particular those interested in Coulomb systems. So the next logical thing to do is ask about a function that varies on the same length scale as the actual um, support of our Coulomb system. And we call this the, you know, the circular law in uh, random matrix theory. We're basically wanting now the function to vary on that length scale. So it's now involved, um, we cannot take the large inner limit immediately. So we have this finite end formula. Then we've got our, um, for heuristics at least, we have to have some insights into the, what's now called a global scale. Again, this is relating to the circular law. This is when the support is scaled, so it's, it's on a unit disk. Um, what is going on with the two-point function? Well, we saw before that the way of thinking, actually, I shouldn't have the hat there. It's uh, not hatted at this stage, excuse that. Um, the way of thinking now, um, yeah, we're not gonna work with the Fourier uh, transform, but implicitly we sort of, <laughs> we, we make use of, of the inside of knowledge of the, of the of the uh, Fourier transform, but it's written in this uh, distributional sense here. So this only makes sense, of course, if we're integrating it against test function. The integrating against test function is doing an antiderivative. We can actually get uh, finite um, quantities out of this insight. So this insight, again, comes from the same reasoning as on the previous slide about that small um, wave number of the uh, structure function. If we have that insight as a heuristic, we can get led to a specific formula for the variance. Although there is an assumption, the assumption is that this is happening uh, in the bulk of the region. If, you know, if it's true, if our heuristic understanding is true, we haven't independently made use of boundary contribution. We will get led to this particular formula for the variance. Now, interestingly, one can actually check this. Uh, on an exact uh, calculation or a particular linear statistic that the um, full distribution can be calculated exactly. So this is a, an example of a linear statistic, just um, in X and Y here are our coordinates in the plane. And it, it turns out, of course, that if we sub into, into this formula, it's an elementary calculation to make it explicit. But as I say, we can actually calculate the, um, Characteristic function of the distribution associated with this linear statistic. It's an element, it's itself a simple calculation. It just goes via the observation that um, we can complete the square, basically. We complete the square, we get a, a Gaussian distribution, which is um, the next level of sophistication beyond what I'm talking about now. I'm talking about the actual explicit formulas for the um, variance but one would want to probe the full distribution. And there is quite a field of study that is the central limit theorems that the actual um, full distribution is a Gaussian. And here we have a, a very simple specific example illustrating that it's a Gaussian. It doesn't even have any correction terms. That's just the Gaussian in large and limit. It's a, a Gaussian uh, for, for finite n. So we can read off what the variance is. Um, and we find that actually we do not get the result that we, um, predicted on the basis of considering only the bulk contribution. It's uh, the final answer is actually twice as big as what our previous prediction gave us. And there is an equal contribution in this example to the surface. So this was, um, this is a way of uh, motivating the uh, properties that there are some non-trivial properties going on at the surface. And 
high considerations, this will probably be my uh, main, um, main point of the rest of the lecture about these um, particular surface properties. Let us uh, see that. And thanks here to Sung Su for the diagram that I <laughs> extracted from one of, one of his papers. Um, the terminal point process that Geneva gave us, Virginia E, explicitly, can be studied because we have a special function here um, that has this transition, uh, an asymptotic formula at what corresponds to the boundary here involving uh, this error function. So we can get an explicit formula for the nature of the correlation functions at the boundary. And uh, we can um, try and make some sense of what it's telling us. So we have our explicit formula. I just point out that it involves uh, error functions. The way of thinking is that we've got our um, origin at the boundary and we have variables that are order one for the spacing. Um, and here is a particular functional form, but we would like to analyze it and make some sense of it. So here it is. Remember we have this connected two point uh, correlation function that's a key to us. We want to analyze this connected two point correlation function as our eigenvalues or our particles. It's, in this case, it's eigenvalues because we're at Geneva's, the GNUE coupling for large separation. And that tells us quite a bit. It tells us that in the direction, the direction of the um, boundary, which is the X direction in our coordinates, we have this algebraic decay, which is very different to what we saw in the bulk where we actually had a Gaussian decay. And that's really uh, why the take home point on why we have this boundary contribution. It's no longer like the bulk, it's very different. Now, what Jankovici had told us was that um, it's actually better to, uh, to interpret for interpretive purposes if we integrate out in the, in the parallel direction, the normal direction, I mean to say, not parallel, in the normal direction to the boundary, if we integrate out to that. And he furthermore um, indicated that later in some later works that the particular, this is one of the examples of a sum rule, the particular value one gets from integrating over this amplitude can be related to the dipole moment. So I should say at a heuristic level, the distinction between the boundary and the bulk is that in the bulk, the screening cloud is circular symmetric. So all the multipoles actually vanish. On the boundary, there is a dipole moment. The symmetry is broken. There is a non-zero dipole moment. This non-zero dipole moment is basically in uh, mathematical in terms of correlation functions given by this quantity here. And it's showing itself in non-trivial ways and gives rise to these particular effects. So um, that's the first uh, result that um, class of results Jankovici obtained. Then as a decade later, continuing studies along these lines, it was realized that the global limit that we thought we considered there was the um, edge scaling limit, the average spacing between particles at the boundary of order one. Now we do the scaling limit global scaling limit to the um, relating to the circular, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, 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 the limit to a disk and the so-called circle um, limit, ask about the boundary of that and uh, yeah, probe eigenvalues close to the boundary of our um, the boundary of the disk here. And then we're integrating out in normal directions. And the prediction is, and this can actually be checked in from Geneva's exact calculation, that we get an expression that's somewhat familiar from uh, the theory of Dyson's uh, log gas. If we do the same calculation on Dyson's log gas in this global limit, apart from the, uh, the eight here, I think it's half of it, we'll get uh, this functional form reappears. So there's some, perhaps uh, in retrospect, not that surprising that the boundary of the Geneva um, ensemble is actually very similar to Dyson log gas, one dimensional log gas. And that's sort of again a heuristic. And we see that uh, quantified to some extent here. And once we have that available, again, at the level of um, heuristic uh, calculation, we can make a prediction to correct our variance formula. 
adding to the bulk term, we have a surface contribution, and then we can check uh, in the exactly solvable case that we um, uh, made the observation that uh, we get the, the missing term here. Now, subsequently, this variance formula has been uh, verified um, in um, calculations that uh, go beyond just the variance, as I mentioned, the, cent the, the um, central limit theorems. It's, it's one of the primary probabilistic uh, topics of study. Well, I haven't got that long to go, but um, sped up a little bit. So this is a topic um, Sung Su, Professor Kang, and others are studying presently. Um, that is the effects of topology and geometry on the asymptotic expansion of partition functions for, for Coulomb systems. And uh, in our studies of Geneva ensembles, there are different variations. Um, we have GNUE. You know, in Geneva's original paper, Gene SC and Gene OE, that, that were real and, and, and Quaternion entries. But if we just stay in the class of complex entries, and subsequent research has led us to um, the so called induced ensemble, which is defined uh, in using rectangular Geneva matrices and um, making use too of unitary matrices. It's led us to spherical ensembles where we consider ratios of Geneva. So in the um, Classical variable setting here, we know if we take ratios of um, uh, Gaussian variables, we get a very long tailed um, Cauchy ver random variable, then we can stereographic project that. And we end up uh, with a uniform distribution on the sphere. So there's a very natural different topologies that um, come up in our studies of the random matrix matrices. We can then go to the corresponding one component plasma we need to put in the normalizations. I couldn't quite find the correct normalization in the uh, case of the annulus, but uh, here they are for the, um, the disc and the uh, sphere. And then the questions can become in our spirit of our thermodynamic probing, we wanna know what the large N expansion to probe the free energy of um, these particular different, uh, different um, both geometry and topology uh, of the, um, the Coulomb gas. And that's a very fruitful uh, area or question to ask. And um, it was probed quite a while ago, and it's uh, recently been um, subject of uh, some significant development. So um, here is a prediction from the mid 1990s that for any of those Coulomb gases that I have just indicated, that the large N expansion will make sense in the sense in that it is um, extensive. First term will be proportional. And that's already non-trivial because we have neutralized the system. So if we didn't neutralize the system, there will be an N log N term, there'll be an N squared term. And in the mathematical literature, they themselves have been the subject of uh, um, research, uh, understanding the origin of them, slightly different perspective to the way we set the problem up in the one component plasma viewpoint. Um, then there'll be a surface tension term proportional to root n. And we sort of saw this already in that expansion of the, um, the energy by uh, Shakarov, um, this, this root n term. But what we didn't see, because the energy is a derivative with respect to beta, there is a log n term prediction. This doesn't depend on beta, this just depends on the actual topology only doesn't depend on the, the, the perimeter or uh, some surface type effect. It's entirely the topology. And this is a prediction that there is the Euler characteristic on 12, it's sort of like a conformal field theory uh, sort of statement with a central charge sort of thing, uh, log n. And then also order one term, I must say, is another field of research, but I won't have time to mention it. So I just uh, make some notes about um, distinctions then between these uh, different Coulomb gases one component plasmas, depending on the um, particular geometry strokes topology that we have uh, of our uh, Coulomb system. So there is distinction obviously with the, with the Euler characteristic and then the surface tension. Well, there's no surface for the sphere. Um, remarkably, there is a, a conjecture for this um, term here. Um, interesting if you get conjecture, if you differentiate with respect to beta, that gives us uh, the energy and then ask what's happened for beta large, which is we know 
low, uh, low temperature. It does go to zero, so it does make some sense. It's continuous or analytic function of beta greater than naught. Um, that's uh, not necessarily uh, expected for the leading term because of the possible crystallization. I don't think that's that well known, so I do draw, draw attention to that particular result. Um, just to indicate um, some another uh, class of uh, Geneva ensembles that gives rise not to a different topology, but to a different geometry. And this is the elliptic genue. We know how to construct uh, such a matrix, uh, an ensemble that has uh, its eigenvalues in an ellipse. And then we can ask ourselves what distinction in this expansion would we expect? Well, this root n here is literally taken to uh, uh, interpretation is a perimeter in the disk. We would have to get a term that was the perimeter of our ellipse um, if we were able to do such an expansion. Otherwise, for the Euler characteristic, topologically it's a disk. So the Euler characteristic is the same. So this is uh, a bit of a frontier of uh, in research. I don't know that we have the uh, asymptotic expansion uh, in that particular case. Well, almost out of time. And um, this is my, indeed my last uh, slide. So where else can we go um, from the viewpoints of the themes that I've been adopting uh, is the Coulomb gas. Well, we can look around for the boundary conditions that are, uh, let's say, clean enough that we have structures that enable the techniques that we are using from Geneva's paper to be carried through. Now in uh, the Gen Se theory, which has been proven to be very fruitful uh, because it relates to a, um, a Fapian point process and has uh, some particular boundary effects. There is a slight variation of that in Coulomb system perspective because Gen Se, the um, image charges are with respect to the real axes, a possibility, normal boundary conditions in a disk. Norman boundary conditions in a disk was actually my supervisor for my honors and masters, um, Edgar Smith. Uh, his 1982 paper was on this uh, particular topic. Uh, he didn't have the same questions in mind that we had. He had the question that Jankovici had put forward about the, the correlation functions on the boundary, really. Correlations on the boundary here are, are exponentially fast, decay, um, because of the image charge. There is no. Um, breaking of the symmetry of the screening cloud. And if we, one was to calculate um, uh, these um, variance formulas, we would not see the boundary term. But I think there's quite a bit to do here, you know, given, given recent advances. A topic that I followed up um, during my PhD was this uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions. That's very natural in Coulomb systems because it's uh, a um, metallic wall. Uh, for beta equals two, you can use a grand canonical ensemble formalism to actually do exact calculations here. And then the questions can become in the spirit of our previous uh, few slides, we can ask about the large N expansion of the um, partition function there and to see these uh, topological type terms. And in the physics literature or theoretical physics literature of Jankovici and colleagues, there are some predictions for the analog of that um, conformal field theory type term there, the log n with the uh, involving the Euler characteristic. One of my um, topics of interest back in PhD times was the two and continuing, if you don't mind, in some collaborative work I've done since, two dimensional one component plasma on a cylinder. So that doesn't have a random matrix analog, but it is solvable case. Um, and in fact, some of the calculations there are actually simpler than in just geometry. So uh, I still think there's more to do uh, on, on this topic. Now, generally, um, one of the advances that Gordon um, introduced in the, the mid 1980s was the observation that, it, that there is a, also a free Fermi coupling for the two dimensional Coulomb gas, two component, two dimensional, that is positive charges and negative charges. So one can make use of um, particular What's it called there? Uh, so we're using in the, the Geneva theory, we're making use of the uh, van der Mond determinant and what um, Gordon introduced makes use of the Cauchy determinant and grand canonical formalism. 
And this was one of the topics that I was most interested in because in the 80s, the, the big um, uh, theme was phase transitions. And I've already made brief mention that positive and negative, uh, that this, plus, yeah, that beta equals four is, is significant in, in the theory of the costless thalus phase transition. So um, quite interestingly, you know, looking back over this sort of 40 year period, um, there's been some significant progress and, and myself and, and, and Sung Su in, in the uh, preface of our uh, book, um, we really can justify our 200 page book from the research of the last, you know, since around about 2010. There has been um, very surprising advances uh, to areas that um, I'm indicating in a sort of an historical progression and really talking about um, concepts that many researchers from the era that I was, my beginning happened, uh, were, were studying. Um, so I'm most happy to see both progress on those particular topics, people uh, sticking at it, finding new perspective. And then uh, what we um, point out in our, our, our book quite a bit is, um, Areas that are entirely new that one wouldn't have thought of, and uh, you know, just to speak one of them could be uh, the study of eigenvectors, for example, turns out to be very fruitful from the perspective of uh, exact solutions and significance in uh, probability theory from from the, the phenomenon of uh, universality. So that would be my last uh, last point. Slightly over time, apologies, but um, my viewpoint back from the early eighties. Um, that exact solutions guide, inform and illustrate general theory. That was very much the way we thought. I'd say now uh, universality classes is one of the big themes in, in random matrix theory. And just generally, um, I think we have a, a bit of a, a ticket to uh, research in this area because it's very rich, has very rich mathematical content. Thanks everybody for listening and um, it's been my pleasure to give the, give the, the lectures. Great. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, inspiring lectures. Uh, any questions or comments from the audience? You can raise your hands uh, if you want to ask any questions or uh, give us any comments. Actually, uh, may I start a, a, a quick question? So, uh, so yeah, I wonder, if, so, so Peter, so this uh, 2D uh, one component pl uh, plasma with Neumann boundary condition in a disk, uh, is this model for beta equal to also forms a, a Pafian point process? Yeah, very much so. So um, there's some subtleties here. It's probably too, too technical to um, burden everybody with, but in, in uh, your many studies relating to, to Gen SE and, and also your most recent one with the with the Professor Kahn on the, the and uh, other collaborator uh, CEO on the large um, N asymptotic expansion here. The subtlety is that in um, the random matrix case, what corresponds to this uh, image term is exactly on equal footing, whereas in the Coulomb system setup. It, it comes with uh, half of the energy is in the image and half's not. Now, what you found in, in your asymptotic expansion is a contribution that, you, that you've identified coming from the, um, I would call it the image, if you like. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, it's not expected that if you put this factor of half, that there'll be such a um, term. So I think that's already an interesting, interesting effect to, to probe. Um, beyond that, you know, your, your contribution has been to, um, one of your contributions been to, to impose this general background and we didn't have that, uh, the, the skills of the um, command of the skew orthogonal polynomials and such thing. But to me, yeah, this is waiting to be, to be looked at and this, <laughs> you certainly have uh, the, um, the skill set to, to uh, do this. It's quite remarkable, as I say, this was the very model that my supervisor was looking at. Uh, back in, in 1982. Um, so mm -hmm. let's uh, dust it off and, uh, and probe um, some aspects of it in, in the context of what we presently have learnt uh, since, yeah, what we've learnt since. Yeah. Uh, 
-hmm. Any questions or comments? Any other questions or comments? And then, uh, uh, may I ask a question? It's a very simple. So, uh, yeah, of course. In the previous slide, you know, uh, the appearance of this oil character is, is I mean, very interesting. But uh, do you have any uh, uh, intuitive way to explain why this term should appear? Well, um, definitely in the Actually, uh, if I can promote my own, uh, unashamedly promote my own research, when I was studying this semi-periodic boundary condition case, I observed it because it's in a strip, if you like, if you make the, um, still wrap the, the, cyl the cylinder, but you make the cylinder longer and longer, and then you can uh, ask us, how does this partition function behave as a, uh, in the periodic direction? I observed the, the, then this um, pi on six L, which I'd already have, in you know in those days in the early in the early nineteen nineties, many people were talking about conformal field theory and statistical mechanical models, and they'd already known that um, from a statistical mechanics viewpoint, you see the conformal field theory term in the constant, and I observed this in this asymptotic expansion in the um, case of semi-periodic boundary conditions. And you can make arguments from mappings from the um, multi-component, one, co one component plasma to a um, type of, uh, it turns out to be Einstein solid, actually quantum Einstein solid. So you can do a transformation. It's not, not, not rigorous, but you can. There are heuristic understandings that convert the Coulomb gas to a, um, basically a, a type of a free Fermi, um, not interacting, uh, well, not entirely not interacting, but um, a quantum mechanical model where the, um, yeah, where it's known that the uh, conformal field theory term will appear. So if one goes back to, my own work, Jankovici's subsequent work, there will be many references that um, uh, relate this term with literature in the field theory. Furthermore, from a Coulomb gas perspective, it will mostly come down to a, a screening phenomena. So we have this universal, um, uh, I mentioned for this, uh, Structure function, structure function, spectral form factor. There is a, a universal um, behavior of, of that, and there's some interrelation between the two. So there's um, some things understood on a heuristic level. Plenty more to do, I say in summary. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? If there is no, uh, let's thank our speaker again. Okay, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very much. I mean, that is a really wonderful talk. Well, it's it's been uh, only entirely an honor. So thank you all. It's a very nice talk, Peter. Thanks. Great. Yeah, let's um, hope that we can uh, continue with some. Overlapping interests uh, in our research, indeed. Uh, once uh, the present projects are entirely completed as well, <laughs> uh, I appreciate I still have a couple of things to do. Uh, but um, there you go. Yeah. On we go.
Yes, I'm right, everybody. Actually, uh, Peter, actually, yeah. uh, before you, you go, uh, may I ask a, an informal question? So uh, in the previous slide, yeah. um, I wonder this uh, surface yeah. tension term, um, this, uh, this, uh, this surface tension, this squared N term in the free energy expansion. So I know yes. this formula uh, for this disk geometry, but uh, is the other uh, formulas for sphere and analysis, uh, what is the reference? I can find this. No, this is just some physical terms that uh, there is no surface for the sphere and the annulus has two boundaries. So um, uh -huh. that's uh, just uh, what you'd expect. I don't think, um, uh -huh. as, as we, as came up in a recent discussion, this formula is not at all well known. It's, uh, it was conjectured and never written down and it's, it's vaguely mentioned in, in a paper I wrote with, with um, Weigman. So, um, yeah. but it can be probed. Um, around beta equals two, because we can do that first order expansion around beta equals two. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, and we also probed it using our um, numerical methods for exact calculations of partition functions using Jack polynomials. We've mm -hmm. got something that's um, consistent with this for beta equals four. Mm -hmm. And if I remember correctly, we got something reasonable for beta equals six. So mm -hmm. it's pretty remarkable um, uh, uh, that this was the case, but no, these other cases, well, We've just observed, well, of course, beta equals two is a bit um, non-typical because beta equals two, this happens to vanish. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you say it's zero uh, for the sphere, you want to go beyond um, beta equals two, but actually, uh, yeah, that, that's analogous calculation that, that uh, Shakarov have done for the um, disk. You know, mm -hmm. I suppose it's, you know, the sphere is sort of simpler because of all the symmetries um, probably already known. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd say that at least perturbatively, there is some um, uh, knowledge of that, but yeah, that's just the start in, in, the, in the topic. And then, yeah, the disk uh, as well, so. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And also, so also sort of related question. So in this O1 term, we are, we have this uh, zeta prime minus one uh, multiplied by Euler characteristic. So is this uh, also some known conjecture for that that term? Well, yeah, I think it, the, the zeta function minus one. Uh, my um, guess there would though that would be restricted to beta equals two. That if you change beta, uh -huh, I that see. you would uh -huh. not see that. So if we already see know that from um, uh -huh the Dyson constant term mm -hmm. that, the, yeah, for example, the, or well, specifically the um, Barnes, uh, yeah, the G function, you do that yes. asymptotic expansion, the constant term depends on beta. So mm -hmm. at beta equals two, it relates to uh, what you just said, or uh, yeah, Riemann zeta minus one, but it doesn't relate anymore uh, okay. beyond mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to get a handle of that. I, I, I doubt that perturbative methods would probe at that fine level, but um, mm -hmm. there you go, yeah. And what, yeah, multiplied by the other characteristic, well, that's another uh, mm -hmm. effect that someone would want to uh, get a, an understanding of, yeah. Okay, I see. Thank you. Very Thank good. You. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. There we go.